Chapter 9 The Story of Akhenaten In this chapter I propose to give the history of the life of Akhenaten, or Amonhotep IV, as it was dictated to me by Onaferu. I will reserve my comments upon the writings until after the reader has had an opportunity of digesting them. However, one point needs mentioning here, and that is the fact that the voices said that I myself, the writer living in London, in the present year of grace, am the reincarnation of Akhenaten. Upon this subject, I have naturally little to say. The reader will notice, however, that my teacher constantly refers to me as Akhenaten. The following writings began in 1925 and finished in the early spring of 1926. On the night of the 24th of March of 1925, the voice began, I am come unto thee, O my son, and I shall continue my lesson concerning thy former life in Egypt. Footnote 1. These writings are extracts from the original scripts. It has probably occurred to thee that most of ancient Egypt has been hidden from modern eyes by being buried. This is a fact, O oh, my son. The sands of time have covered what was once royal and ancient Egypt. It is no use seeking on the surface the bulk of what once made Egypt the first power on the earth is at this present time hidden many yards below the sand's surface. I tell thee that the buildings left by the Egyptians were very durable, and even as the pyramids and the Sphinx remain, so does much of Memphis and many other cities that have never come to light as far as modern eye can see. Much more will be found concerning Amonhotep IV, even as I did tell thee as early as March of this present year, much proof has been afforded thee, and now it only remains for thee to give out that knowledge in the right manner. I tell thee that thy father, Monhotep III, was Pharaoh of the Exodus. Thy Bible hath been distorted out of all knowledge by the ritual priests. Thou wast the second son of Amonhotep III, and Queen Tai, or Taito. She did come from the Tigris River and was a woman after the heart of God. She did not know God as ye know him, but she was a very good woman. Thou thyself was Amonhotep the Fourth, even as I have told thee in times past in thy writings. Thy priests did call thee Akhenaten. My son, on this day do I also confirm what I did tell thee long ago. Thy body hath never been found. It will be found together with the skeleton, that of a young woman which will be found in the burial place. She doth still have about her various trinkets of jewelry, among them a ring with rubies set therein even as a marquise. She was carried into the tomb by one Ophalenku, thy court musician and a priest of thy cult. The skeleton in thy burial chamber is thy ray affinity, for wast thou not a dual ray of the branch of the father king? Thy treasures will be found together with a ring in which is set a blood red ruby stone from which that on the hand of the skeleton was copied at thy command. Footnote 1. Harish the court singer. This ruby was used by thee to keep away what thou didst call the black magic of Amen-Ra. Footnote 2. Can also be spelt Amen. Thou didst die at the age of thirty-five, and not thirty as is stated now, 
thou didst reign twenty years and not seventeen as is also stated thou didst ascend the throne at the young age of fifteen thou didst die of what is now called pneumonia then called the equivalent of hemorrhage to the lungs it is said that thou didst live a happily family life I say, nay, my son, is it possible that thou shouldest have set up monuments and engravings depicting a miserable domestic life? For it is only because of these seemingly happy representations that men do say that thy life was happy. Footnote 3 Since this message was received, evidence has come to light that Akhenaten and Nefertiti quarreled. See Tell El Amarna by J. L. Pendlebury or Lovat Dixon. The initiate brothers, who still existed as a very secret and select body, broke away from the material priesthood of Amen and practiced the old worship of Aten or Atanu which was the religion of Heliopolis during the early dynasties of the Devil Empire. They were regarded with much disfavor by the priests of Amen, who were purely looking for material advancement, and they were forced to live in seclusion and even hiding until the time of the Monhotep III. He it was who wedded with the woman from the Tigris River who was the incarnate female half of Edolimayu, the eleventh master mentioned in the genealogical tree of the divine dynasty. See the Book of Truth. She it was, my children, who persuaded the king to cease persecuting the followers of Atanu, and under her protecting hand, the cult grew and the ancient shrines of Heliopolis again reopened and preached without fear the worship of Aten or Atanu. The day at length came when the queen's youngest son became heir to the throne of his father, his elder brother Tothmosis having been killed in battle east of the delta of Lower Egypt. Footnote 1. The Exodus of the Tribes. During the lifetime of his parents, the young prince was taught the worship of Aten as the one god of life and light and his manifestation to mankind through nature and the solar disk. The young prince gladly absorbed all that his teachers told him, for he was of a loving and peaceful disposition and hated wars and in especial the bloody sacrifices of the priests of Amun. In the twelfth year of his life he was sent to the center of Heliopolis where he learnt the initiation of Ra Atanu. In the meanwhile, the priests of Amen were becoming more and more perturbed as he was the successor to the throne. The time had arrived when Amenhotep III was becoming feeble in health and being urged by the queen Taito, the mother of his younger son Amenhotep, he sent unto Heliopolis and commanded that the young prince should be made co-regent with him. Young Amonhotep's age was now close upon fifteen years, and the queen, together with the rest of the followers of Atanu Ra, thought it wisest to secure the succession before the death of her husband, Amonhotep III. The old monarch had become more and more dominated by the priesthood of Heliopolis after the death of his eldest son, Tothmosis, chiefly because he blamed the priesthood of Amun for the expedition which had caused his son's death. However, from that time onward, the power of Amun waned and the son of Atanu rose in the heavens. It soon became generally accepted that young Amonhotep would be able to keep the throne, especially as his mother Taito was popular amongst the people and the priesthood of Amen could not count upon enough support to foster a revolution. However, the people became uneasy because the young king refused to marry and therefore, as they said, could have no heir. 
Also, much to the annoyance of the royal court, his attentions were paid to his chief singer, who had become a devout follower of Atanu. The sound of music and things spiritual filled the king with rapture, and it soon became clear that he would, in all probability, try to make her queen and pass over the princesses of the royal house, who had never withdrawn their allegiance from Amen. Thus, about the first year of the co-regency, the priests of Heliopolis visited the old king and his son in Thebes and urged him to marry the Mitannian princess, who had been sent by Dushrata, her father, to be the wife of Amanhotep III. This Akhenaten eventually did, and the results which accrued and which we know were to be his downfall with all he stood for. Archaeological records of the marriage of Nefertiti to Akhenaten were factual but misleading because, like everything else connected with his hatred of the cult of Amun, even the stela found at Akhenaten does not give mention of Thebes as the original place of the marriage, but only states that the king Akhenaten was married to Nefertiti and had two daughters. About a year after the birth of his second daughter in Thebes, the city of Akhenaten was completed and became the twin capital of Egypt with Thebes. It was not till later when Akhenaten thought himself strong enough to make a complete break with the old capital of Amun, though in reality he never was, that he and his court withdrew to Akhenaten completely. It was at that point that he deprived the Amunite fathers of Thebes of all their political power and revenues and ordered the erasing of the names of Amun and his wife Mut from the temples. By now, Nefertiti had been married to Akhenaten for several years, but originally by the priests of Amun. For the same reason that he changed his name from Amun to Aten, he had to be reunited, in the eyes of his followers, to Nefertiti through the Atanuic priesthood. Consequently, he was remarried to her in Akhetaten, thereby setting at rest both his conscience and that of the Aten whose chief priest he was. There were no half measures in Egypt in those days and the chief thing of importance was for the king, in this case, the representative of the Aten to be right. After the final departure to Akhetaten, Akhenaten maintained one shrine to Aten at Thebes and this shrine was built almost entirely underground and was walled in all around. None were allowed near, and its secrets were never known after his death. It was entered by a series of secret doors moved by levers, and it was to this place that his followers conveyed his dead body, so that it should escape discretion at the hands of the priests of Amun. Threw herself into the Nile waters, thinking to find rest with Atanu Ra, where she intended to await the coming of her lover, Akhenaten. This son was housed secretly with his mother at Heliopolis, and it was intended that upon the death of his father, Akhenaten, he should ascend the throne of Egypt, and so carry on the religion of Aten, which doubtless would have come to pass, had not the holy fathers of Amen at Thebes gained news of this intended heir. They resolved upon a plan to seize the young boy and bring him up in the temple of Amun so that they could produce him as a rival to Akhenaten. For this purpose, they sought the help of Nefertiti, who plotted secretly with them from Akhenaten to bring this about. Nefertiti only helped in the forming of the plan for this first abduction, but she did not actually take an active part in it. Thus, Akhenaten had no idea that through jealousy, for remember she could produce no male offspring, she took her revenge by destroying her husband's chance of having a direct male successor to carry on the cult of Aten. The part she played in this abduction, Akhenaten did not find out at once, but when he did, she was sent to live in exile within the limits of the city of the horizon from which she escaped to Thebes some three years later. Alas, how low stooped the beautiful Nefertiti. The priesthood of Amun had offered rich gifts and she had accepted. 
the little son of Harish, was stolen by wiles from the priest fathers of Heliopolis. Footnote 1. The setting up of two incompetent thieves as a rival pharaoh to his father at Akhetaten was not a compromise trying to bring the two cults together. A theory which has been put forward by Professor Pendlebury, but was meant to bring about the downfall of Akhenaten. The priests of Amen assumed that their puppet regime, with two in common at its head, would eventually denude Akhenaten of the support of the Egyptian people in general, and so destroy the whole edifice he had built up. What actually happened was that upon Nefertiti's disgrace and flight to Thebes, Akhenaten at once named Semenkari as his successor, not co-regent, in an attempt to save his Atanuic regime from complete collapse at his death. The name of Aten could no longer depend upon its nearest of kin. No wonder was it that Akhenaten philosopher, poet, and priest, as he was, became sick at heart and languished in spirit. Even the beautiful palaces ceased to bring joy to his crushed spirit. The Gorgon of Amun again raised its evil head at Thebes, and its witchcrafts were subscribed to by the beautiful one Nefertiti. She practiced the black secrets of the evil genie and sought companionship with soothsayers and all those who had devils for company. Later, when Tutankhamun had reached the age of about seven years, Nefertiti quarreled with the priests of Amun, and just as she had intrigued with them to bring the young boy to Thebes. She now fled back to Akhetaten, taking the child with her and threw herself among the mercy of her husband. Things did not work out as she expected, and Tutankhamun was installed as twin ruler with his father Akhenaten. Nefertiti herself was sent to live in disgrace outside the palace, and from then on she was a virtual prisoner until shortly before the death of Akhenaten. With the return of two in common, Semenkari stood down in the succession. When it was known that Akhenaten's health was rapidly failing and that he had not very long to live, Nefertiti, profiting by the chaos then existing, spirited herself and two in common out of the city of the horizon and fled back again to Thebes, taking with her also Ankhnes Pa'aten her third daughter who was married to Tutankhamun. Semenkari hated Nefertiti because of his own fidelity and love for Akhenaten, and had she remained in the city of the horizon, she would almost certainly have been killed. After this last flight to Thebes, she is heard of no more. Footnote 2. After the death of Tutankhamun in Thebes, my information tells me that Nefertiti was killed on Horemheb's orders, when he seized the throne in the name of Amun at Thebes, he was formerly Akhenaten's military chief of staff at Akhetaten, and had chafed at not being allowed to go to the defense of the governors of the Palestinian Empire, who had asked for military aid, and therefore he was exceedingly hostile to the entire Akhetaten regime. My children, the empire became sadly disrupted and the Syrian possessions as well as the Asiatic Empire ceded from Egypt and proclaimed their independence. Harish, the mother of Tutankhamun, when she heard of the kidnapping of her son, became so grief-stricken that she flung herself into the waters of the Nile, just outside Heliopolis, and her body was afterwards found by the priests of Atanu, washed up onto the banks of the river. When Ankhnaten heard the sad news, he hardly ever smiled again, but devoted himself even more closely to the temple of Aten. The body of Harish was taken at his commands to the shrine of Thebes, and it remains there to this day, my children, and will be discovered when the secrets of that temple tomb are revealed. The time had arrived when the great double empire of Egypt was in a deplorable condition, the laws of the land were set at naught, and murder and robbery were rife. Revolt was also breaking out amongst the two sects of Amun and Aten, 
and the king lived more like a prisoner in his capital at El Amarna. At length, broken in health and seared to the soul by his failure to bring about the religious revolution, he fell sick and contracted hemorrhage of the lungs, which was equivalent to what is called pneumonia in your present day of incarnation. Upon Achenine's death, Semenkari seized the throne, thus delaying the inevitable downfall of the Atanuic regime by some two or maybe three years. He reigned only in Akhetaten, never, as some authorities have said, in Thebes. He fought nobly against the overwhelming odds which confronted him, but alas, all was in vain. The sorcerers at Thebes, spurred on by the evil one, who had once lived a royal queen in Akhetaten, raised up the little son of Harish and set him up to destroy the life's work of his father. Alas, the heavens closed and the rays of Aten lost their strength. Amun prevailed and the light of Aten was hidden from the temples. So ended the sad struggle between king and priesthood, the one striving for honesty and love, the other for extortion and lies. The veil fell and all was lost. Behold, it rises again, that those sad days may be reconstructed. They, the figures in that ancient tragedy, are incarnate again, and must work out their destinies afresh. Therefore I say unto thee, go forward and, knowing the past, strive to bring the future to a successful conclusion. Be not headstrong, but work slowly and surely that each foundation stone laid may remain steadfast even unto the day of revelation, which is not far distant. The death of Akhenaten was the signal for a general uprising of the people of all classes. The two chief centers of Ra Atanu at Heliopolis and El Amarna were able for a time to carry on their religion, but after a brief period of two years, these remnants of the religion of Akhenaten perished and the worship of Amun was again constituted at Thebes. The great temples and palaces of Aten, which had been built at great labor and expense by Akhenaten, were despoiled and the great granite blocks used for their construction carried to Thebes, where temples were erected in honor of Amun and his wife Mut, also were the old temples repaired. The Atanuic shrine at Thebes, which I have already mentioned, was destroyed as far as the external buildings were concerned. But all trace of the subterranean chambers was lost, for the suspicions of the holy fathers of Amun had not been aroused so that no thorough search was made. The actual upper temple, which was rectangular in construction, was despoiled, as was also the wall which protected it from public view. There was also the great altar to the sun's disk which was surrounded by the life-giving orb from which reached out hands after the same manner as the symbol which surmounted the great temple of the sacred heights of Atlantis, which I have already described to you, my children, in the commencement of these my chronicles. Statues of the king Akhenaten were also lavishly exhibited round the courts of the temple and he was often depicted in the guise of the sun spirit who was Horus, my beloved son and ray child. Some statues of the king have already been found in connection with this temple, but more have yet to come to light. I would also here tell you that the discovery of this temple at Thebes was prophesied through the pen of El Irasifu during the middle of 1925, and many can come forward in support of these things which I now tell you. Also, my children, for the benefit of those among you who have not seen it recorded, it was subsequently discovered. Footnote 1. The actual name of Karnak was given. Thus was the prophecy fully justified. Having given you the life story of Akhenaten with its embodied prophecies as dictated to me in my scripts, I will now show you how many of these have already been fulfilled. I was told that the body of Akhenaten had never been found from the original tomb in his city of Akhetaten to Thebes. This suggestion met with a storm of ridicule for the simple reason that experts said he could not enter Thebes 
because it was the stronghold of the hated Ammonite priesthood, and Akhenaten was the heretical devotee of the god Aten or Atanu. The further statements that statues of Akhenaten and a sun temple to Aten would be found at Karnak or Thebes were received with even greater amusement. However, these prophecies were proved and the scoffers made to eat their words. The prophecies were made in 1925. In April 1926, the Times published an article stating that statues in a temple to the heretic Pharaoh Akhenaten had been found at Karnak. Thus, you will see how the voices had been proven true in their story. Much more will be found concerning the Monhotep IV or Akhenaten. The voice said, did it not? And indeed, a host of things has been discovered since at Tel El Amarna and Karnak. In the latter place, a further statue of much importance was discovered in January 1931. Much light can also be thrown on the exodus by the Tel El Amarna letters written to Akhenaten and not to Amanhotep III, as stated by some. Finally, the body in the Cairo Museum stated emphatically to be that of Akhenaten was admitted not to be his body by Dr. Engelbach, amongst others. In fact, they said it was probably that of Semen Kari, his successor. The Morning Post of the 28th of January, 1931 said, Mystery of a Mummy. Further excavations have been made to clarify the mystery of the mummy of King Akhenaten of the 18th dynasty, who introduced a short-lived monotheistic cult into Egypt about 1375 BC. The mummy has hitherto not been discovered and some archaeologists believe that the king was never buried, being branded by his successors as a heretic. A search has been carried out to trace the burial place of Akhenaten and the Antiquities Department at Cairo has now issued a communique, according to Reuter, stating that excavations at Tel El Amarna have resulted in the finding of parts of Akhenaten's magnificent alabaster canopic chest with protecting vultures at the corners, together with pieces of the lid capped with the king's head, the chest. The communique continues, gives evidence that it was never used, for it is quite unstained by the black resinous substance seen on those of Amen II and Tutankhamun. The last paragraph in this article gives definite proof to the messages of the voice, which declare that Akhenaten's body was not buried at Tel El Amarna but was removed elsewhere. The Daily Mail of the 10th of December, 1931, quoted from the Chronicles of Osiris on this matter, heading its article, Mystery of a Pharaoh. The amusing part is that, having strenuously withstood all attempts to dispute the identity of the body, they then said that it would never be found. Why? They do not give any reason for this conclusion except that Akhenaten was a hated heretic, but so was Semen Kari and they have, so they say, found him. Then the statements concerning Tutankhamun, that he was the son of Akhenaten by one Harish, an unofficial wife, were also disputed. However, on the 7th of March, 1926, a year after these statements, the following appeared in the Illustrated London News and was the view of a very well-known Egyptologist, the late Mr. Howard Carter. Careful study suggests indeed that Tutankhamun was the son of Akhenaten by one of the less official weddings of that ruler and that he, Tutankhamun, was married to the crown princess, a custom not uncommon among the pharaohs and designed to ensure the continuation of the dynasty. Nefertiti, the great royal and official wife, had no male issue. The question that arises is, who was Tutankhamun's mother? Finally, a point which has caused many authorities to condemn my writings most energetically was the statement that Akhenaten and Nefertiti, his queen, were estranged and finally separated. However, Dr. J. L. Pendlebury, the great authority in Akhenaten's reign who was in charge of excavations at Tel El Amarna, stated in his book, Tel El Amarna, Levat Dixon, that Nefertiti fell into disgrace and was sent to live in another part of the city of the horizon. Footnote 1, Tel El Amarna. The Egyptological reply to this was that it seemed incredible that Akhenaten should have quarreled with one so beautiful. This is obviously not an argument, but a very feeble struggle to try to maintain their old and worn out theories. 
I think that to conclude this chapter dealing with Akhenaten, I will quote and extract from my very own foreword to the Chronicles of Osiris, for it shows the slender theories upon which the claim to have found Akhenaten's body at Thebes in 1907 was based. I said then, another debatable point on which I should like to touch is the claim that the mummy of Akhenaten or Akhenaten has been found. When the facts of this claim are clearly seen, they certainly do not carry much weight. The tomb in which the remains were found was supposedly the tomb of Queen Taito, mother of Akhenaten. The rock tomb of El Amarna never received his body as it was well recognized that on the death of Akhenaten, the religion of Aten would be suppressed and the wrath of the priests of Amun be vented upon the king's mummy, which would certainly never have been allowed to remain in the royal tomb. It was therefore conveyed elsewhere as can be seen from the later chapters of this book. Continuing, however, with the facts surrounding the body found in 1907 at Thebes, it must be said that the chamber first encountered contained the remains of Queen Taito's parents in a second chamber hewn out of the rock and supposed to be the tomb of Queen Taito was found a very dilapidated coffin enclosing a more dilapidated mummy, of which the bones only remained. The cartouches were obliterated, although certain inscriptions to Aten were faintly visible, as were also seals of Tutankhamun, which is shown in the following pages to have been the son of Akhenaten. Canopic jars containing the viscera, heart, etc. were found, but it was again a matter of conjecture whether these remains were those of a male or a female. The discoverers of this tomb maintained the fact of the sculptured heads surmounting the jars being beardless is no proof that they represented a woman, as it was believed that Akhenaten was never represented with a beard. Against this can be placed the evidence of the last statues of Akhenaten found at Karnak, where he is represented with a beard. A circlet which M. Maspero and others call a queen's crown and which is thus labeled in the Cairo Museum was also found. M. Maspero's pronouncement is that, however contradicted by the founders of these supported remains of Akhenaten, the fact adduced in contradiction that this circlet was found with the tail and not the head of the bird over the forehead seems to be a flimsy one. And at any rate, both parties are entitled to their points of view for nobody has hitherto been in a position to contradict them. This is given as only one example of the widely divergent opinions which surround these remains. This is given as only one example of the widely divergent opinions which surround these remains. It is well known that the Egyptians often substituted other bodies for their own, especially where a royal mummy was concerned. The reason being that if any person wished to invoke the Ka of the deceased, they could do so by obtaining access to the body and then operating their black magic, but they could not invoke the Ka unless they actually had access to the body. They could not, for instance, invoke the Ka of A by practicing their arts on the body of B. The followers of Akhenaten knew perfectly well that if the priests of Amun found his body, they would seek to operate their black magic upon it. They therefore placed the body of one of his stewards in the tomb so that when the priests of Amun should come, they would think it to be the mummy of Akhenaten. Their invocations would be useless and they would depart in blissful ignorance of the fact that the actual mummy was peacefully resting elsewhere. I was well aware of the claims put forward and as I was warned by my guides of the arguments which would have to be met and was asked not to accept things blindly. When the messages first came to me, I was entirely ignorant of Egyptian history. The names were as Greek to me and I knew absolutely nothing of Akhenaten's life or times. I had never read books on Egyptology and, curiously enough, I had no friends who were Egyptologists, nor had I then ever set foot in Egypt. My information has come to me and is coming to me from a super 
physical source, and this can be vouched for by many important persons. The findings of Achenine's temple at Karnak was predicted to me, and the prophecy was duly fulfilled. All the messages have been tested and examined very carefully, and in view of past happenings, I see no reason for mistrusting our data. After all, certain historical facts which appear in the scripts can be proved by existing Egyptological records. I was as ignorant of the subject of these writings as I am today of the Chinese language, of which I know not one word. It is admitted by Mr. Arthur Weigel in his Life and Times of Akinain, published by Thornton Butterworth, that Professor Seth published in the Nach Richter der K. Jeselschaft der Wissenschaften zu Göttingen in 1921, an article in which he came to the conclusion that the mummy found was probably not that of Akhenaten. There are also others who, like Professor Seth, hold the same views concerning the identity of the remains. However, the reader may judge for himself after reading the following pages of script all the time bearing in mind that the events detailed are not extracted from the pages of any book but came by way of clairaudient dictation. The actual finding of the body of Akhenaten has not yet taken place but taking into account the accuracy of the details already given me and proved it seems only reasonable to suppose that this prophecy also stands an exceedingly good chance of being fulfilled. Appendix to preceding chapter. The reader might be interested to know what Professor T. E. Peet says in the book entitled Kings and Queens of Akhenaten. In the book entitled Kings and Queens of Ancient Egypt, on page 113 in the chapter on Akhenaten, Tai Nefertiti, unless we have misinterpreted the evidence, deserted him. Had the contemplated life began to pall on her, or was she seduced by offers from the adherents of Amun and Thebes who saw in her, as the embodiment of the succession, a popular rival to her husband for the throne? We do not know and we may never know. On the doorway of a tomb in Thebes, number 139, is a hieratic graffito dated in the third year of King Akapiri, son of Re Nefer Neferuaten. The tomb itself dates from the reign of Amenhotep III, and the graffito must be as late as that reign or later. Amenhotep had a son named Akapiri, older perhaps than Akhenaten. And this son may have ruled for a year or two in Thebes, and may be the king here referred to. Daguerreus Davies, however, hints at another possible explanation. Nefer Neferuaten was the name of Queen Nefertiti. Did she, about the twelfth year later, disappear from Akhetaten to appear in Thebes as a rival ruler to her husband, representing a party anxious to return to orthodoxy, or at least? or compromise? This is the purest conjecture. Davies gives it only as such and as such we quote it. What is certain is that her name disappeared from Akhetaten under circumstances which point rather to disgrace than to death and the place knew her no more. On page 29 he adds, the excavations at Tel El Amarna in 1922 however revealed a fact which gives rise to the very interesting speculation. A palace called Marnatin, built by Akhenaten at the south end of his new city, was excavated and found to consist of several parts built at different dates, some before and some after year 9. In three of the parts, one of which was or contained a sanctuary called the Shade of Re Nefertiti, mentioned in other inscriptions, the queen's name had been in many cases erased and that of her daughter Meritaten substituted. This might of course be explained by supposing that buildings originally constructed for Nefertiti were transferred to her daughter, she herself receiving better accommodation elsewhere. The changes however are of too radical a character to make 
such an explanation probable, and we are thrown back on two alternatives, namely that the queen either died or was disgraced. In favor of the latter may be cited the facts that Meritaten, in substituting her own name, never gives her affiliation to Nefertiti, which we should naturally expect to find, and that on a statue base found in Egypt many years ago, on which Akhenaten and Meritaten are named, the name of Nefertiti, who was given as mother of Meritaten, has been carefully erased. If such a disgrace took place, it must have been towards the end of the reign. We do not know the date of her death. Statements to the effect that she survived in the reign of Horemheb or even that of Seti I are totally devoid of foundation. 